Life Federation's The Hyde. Hello, this is The Hyde Podcast, um, brought to you from the Milford Hills, which is the premier shooting facility in the state of Wisconsin. I'm sitting here today with Mark Kakich, who is a member of the Wisconsin Wildlife Federation, and I am Taylor Finger, the game bird ecologist with the Wisconsin DNR. So Mark, happy to, this is our first one we're going to be doing. Uh, or what, what Will you let people know what exactly we are going to be doing with this podcast? Well, it's good we're finally getting off the ground, Taylor. I think that uh, Wisconsin Wildlife Federation, uh, who's sponsoring the podcast here, is really looking forward to you know a long opportunity throughout the year and, and years to come to provide uh, information and sounding board for Wisconsin hunters, not just waterfall hunters, but you know all the folks who use the outdoor resources in Wisconsin. Uh, we will not be talking deer and wolves here on the podcast. We'll leave that for all the other professionals. Perfect. Yeah. No, I, I'm a, a game bird expert, and yeah, I think that's really what we want to focus on for both sportsmen as well as just citizens out there that this is going to be an opportunity to hear about upcoming research, upcoming hunting regulations, um, how things work, the history of, of how things have been done here in the state of Wisconsin. And really we want to touch base and recognize the partnerships that go into how all of this works on an annual basis as well as throughout the years. Yes. And, and I think it's going to be important now, this is going to be a great opportunity, uh, you know, a wide scale to hear from the constituents that we have, you know, to see what they have to say in regards to waterfall and, and other hunting and opportunities that we have and that hopefully we'll have in the future. Yeah, like again, there's we have so many things. I hope folks to tune in because we'll be talking we have topics on upcoming duck and goose research on swans we're also going to be looking at potential changes to hunting seasons and how people can get involved with that and then bringing in guests whether we're talking about uh food how to prepare for food or how to prep your gun for the hunting seasons or things that you need to know before the season during the season and after the season and then for for those that are out there whether we're talking maybe the best properties in the state of wisconsin to go birding or to spend some time out using that habitat so yeah i, I think this is going to be a really excellent opportunity and hope folks tune in Agreed. Agreed. You know, Taylor, you've been with the DNR now, oh, got to be at least nine years with the DNR. And I think, you know, I think the folks need to know what your, how your career has, you know, developed into the role that you have now, because it's, it's a long way from where day one was to where we are today in your career. Yeah, absolutely. And again, and, you know, we are fortunate enough to have Mark here as one of the hosts of this podcast. He's for the last 30 years, he's been working with organizations like Ducks Unlimited, Wisconsin Waterfowl Association, Wisconsin Wildlife Federation, you know, lived on the east side of the state. Now kind of makes his home near Horicon, which is the largest cattail marsh this side of the Mississippi River. So again, eat, breathe and sleep all of everything that we can with public land. And I, again, I hope that folks uh, recognize that we, we have a breadth of experience going into this and I think that uh, I think that there's going to be a lot of value whether you are a hunter or you're not a hunter. And I, I think with the two of us we should have some great guests to the show. Um, got Joel Clayfish to do some cooking segments and you know Joel's a fantastic chef and I think he's going to bring a great great piece with the cooking a lot of great opportunities to cook different ways and i think that is really uh, one of the things that's bringing hunting to the forefront and bringing in some new folks you know through our three efforts to uh to explore and experience hunting as a new opportunity so i, I can't wait to bring joel in and we have some other great uh, chefs that will participate you know over time as well with the program Right. Yeah, I think we can be bringing in uh, state wardens and federal wardens to answer any questions that people may have as it relates to hunting regulations. We get calls and emails, you know, all year long asking, hey, is this OK or what are something I need to be worried about? Uh, additionally, through, you know, my contacts, I'm thinking about bringing in some Ph.D. students on some research so people can get an idea of, OK, how are mallards traveling across the country? What are the data that we have with the telemetry units? We're putting trans, uh, transmitters on things like wood ducks and Canada geese and swans. And just, again, it, that's the cool stuff. That's the stuff that folks really want to see. And we'll, hopefully we'll have some uh, 
guests that can be bringing that experience and that knowledge and share with the public because most most people don't know that that research is going on so hopefully we can be a venue to get that information out yeah our seasons are based off of science and you know having some of the best du biologists in the midwest and, and some in the state i think a lot of folks don't realize that how much money is being poured into wisconsin annually from organizations such as ducks unlimited and federal duck stamp money um, they don't realize that this money benefits the state in so many different um areas you know from clean air clean water uh, to deer turkey pheasants you know all the aspects of hunting and non-hunting that we have here you know yeah i mean again yeah the amount of money that the state gets back from the the state duck stamp which again more recently thank to all of the stakeholder groups that uh, advocated to increase the duck stamp. It hadn't been increased since the 90s. And now, you know, with a $12 duck stamp, you know, two thirds of that money comes right back to the state of Wisconsin and one third goes up to Canada to manage habitat on the breeding grounds for the birds that do migrate through the state. And like you said, whether we're talking clean air or, I mean, things that people don't think about is putting wetlands on the ground help with flood abatement, help with those types of things. So even if you're a hunter or a non-hunter, that money directly can go in and impact uh, the amount or what people see on the landscape. So absolutely yeah absolutely. absolutely so yeah like again we're going to kind of get in and start talking about some of the topics that we've had laid out for this first show it's kind of more of an informational item um so people know exactly who we are what this podcast is going to be and then how you know federal and state regulations are determined through a flyway process and so yeah i just wanted to touch base on on that because that's the number one thing that we get every year is how come the state can't change the regulations to this or for waterfall hunting in specific or migratory bird hunting and because migratory birds are federally managed by the u.s fish and wildlife service all of the hunting regulations have to go through the fish and wildlife service the state was it's not like deer hunting it's not like bear hunting where we have it in code we just can't make up our own right that's that's exactly what it is and then there have to be consistent between flyways so um, we have four flyways that are basically managed off of the migratory pathways of these four different distinct flyways uh, that we have. We have the Atlantic Flyway on the East Coast, the Mississippi Flyway, which is what Wisconsin is in, the Central Flyway, which includes like the Dakotas um, all the way down to Texas, and then the Pacific Flyway, which is your West Coast states. And so, you know, we, we hear like, oh, how come Louisiana has a different hunting season than we do? Well, in all reality, they don't. They're part of the Mississippi Flyway. It's 14 states and three Canadian provinces. And so the length of the season and the bag limits in Louisiana is exactly the same as it is in Wisconsin. We're different than say like the Dakotas, so again, another question that we get every single year is how come North Dakota can have over 70 days of hunting and Wisconsin can only have 60? And that is directly impacted by the number of people utilizing the resource. So the Mississippi Flyway has over half of the number of hunters in the country within our flyway out of the four. So we have a lot of hunters and that's why our season tends to be shorter or is shorter than the other uh, flyway say the pacific flyway is a 107 day season it's just be, there's there's ducks over there but there's not a lot of hunters so our season is shorter and our bag limits tend to be smaller because the impact that those hunters could have on the resource in whole we harvest a lot of birds in the mississippi flyway yeah again number of hunters is the most and the number of birds that migrate through our flyway is the most so it, so again it, it makes sense that that we want to make sure that we're managing our harvest we want to make sure that we're managing the populations you know, responsibly. Yeah, some of the things that, you know, in, in my lifetime, I'm growing up in, in waterfall hunting primarily is Arkansas, Louisiana, they always got to shoot more birds than we did, you know, and, and the seasons did vary and change. However, the way things are set up, like you say right now, is the season structure, uh, as far as harvest goes, is the same throughout the flyway, with the exception of Canada, you know, they have their own seasons. Right. Yeah, again, different country in itself. Their, you know, their bag limits tend to be higher and those things along those lines. But yeah, no, and, and it's interesting and, and how this has shifted, con, you know, considering when you were young, 
the birds are I, behaving. I, still yes, <laughs> the the birds are still uh, are starting to behave a little bit different. You know, we again we get questions as is the migration shifted, you know, uh, like what's going on, and what we're seeing is it's not shifting west or east really. It's more or less are, are those birds willing to migrate as far south, and we've definitely been hearing that from our Louisiana folks. Uh, that you know they've had some really poor hunting seasons over the last decade compared to what they remember 20 or 30 years ago which you know is directly influenced on what's pushing those birds far enough south and wisconsin i mean talk about diving duck hunting and great lakes usage those birds don't leave now if if those those lakes don't freeze those birds don't leave and we've seen that shift over the last 30 40 years of Primarily, those birds would go all the way down to the, the Gulf, and now if they don't get cold, they don't get ice, they don't leave. Right. I mean, there's an estimated 25,000 redheads in Michigan right now that should be in the Laguna Madre in Mexico. Right. But uh, yet they're still, you know, 3,000 miles north, roughly, of where they're supposed to be. And who would have thought? Right. You know. Yeah, and I mean, in the, in the country right now, we're, you know, the 20th of January, the season's coming to an end in the next 11 days or so. So... Those, there's a lot of birds still north of areas that have a hunting season right now that aren't going to get the opportunity at them. So yeah, it's it's been it's just a, a shift in how we look at things now and where money's being spent, where habitat projects are being done, making sure that we're putting them in areas that the birds are actually going to utilize. Well, who would have thought that you could go to Horkheim Marsh on October 20th and potentially not see or hear a Canada goose, right? Yeah, it's unbelievable. Again, you know, I, you having grown up in that that area i know my dad you know when i was a kid would talk about the days of being able to shoot one canada goose a season if you were lucky. yeah if you were lucky to get a tag and now you know in the horicon area we're talking either five or three canada geese a day for 107 days and but the number of birds on that property has completely shifted compared to back in the 60s and 70s where you had 300 or 400 thousand canada geese using a refuge and now, like you said, if you get a couple thousand geese using that refuge, it's and it's and again, just you know, for folks, it's it, those birds. There's a lot more Canada geese now than there ever were, you know, back in the '60s and '70s. It's just how the birds are using the landscape. You know, those birds are spread out. Again, we hear this every year. How come we don't see the geese, whether it's on Big Green Lake or uh, you know Grand River Marsh or things like that? They used to have thousands of these birds. And now you don't see them nowhere near in the number. And what, what happened was those giant Canada geese that, you know, that population has been increasing rapidly over the last 30 years, they weren't here. So when those geese migrated from Canada, they would go to the one, the good habitat where all the other geese were, which was at Horicon, which was at, at Grand River Marsh. And that's where they would all concentrate. Well, now a Canada goose migrating in from Canada sees a Canada goose in every Walmart parking area in every uh, DOT uh, mitigation area and every golf course and every city park and essentially are decoying those birds to all of those areas and they're no longer having to concentrate in the thousands like we used to see them. So again, it's not less birds on the landscape, it's just where those birds are, are concentrated. And, and it involves non-targeted species, you know, I mean, just in horror kind of alone, you know, we have over 30 nesting pairs of swans, yep. you know, look at all the pelicans, to, you know, Comorants. I mean, it's just not you know, the huntable species that are changing throughout, you know, oh, yeah. Mississippi fly. Pelicans, I mean, again, 25, 30 years ago, you didn't see a pelican, and now they're everywhere, whether you're talking on the Wisconsin River down by Baraboo or Sauk City, or you're talking on Green Bay or Lake Michigan, they are absolutely everywhere, and it's been a kind of a cool thing, and it's like, they just showed up and they continued to show up like we get it they found some good habitat found some good nesting areas and their population has exploded and we're going to continue to see it going on yeah and they, and they love little baby carp <laughs> right yeah, somebody else take advantage of them right no so yeah um again i just wanted to to give some of that background on the flyway stuff for folks to understand that you know the way these seasons are set up we uh we get basically a sideboard set by the Fish and Wildlife Service and then the state of Wisconsin, myself, I do a trip going around each spring um, to ask for public input, to ask for feedback on what the hunting season sh should be within those sideboards. And which is unique, Wisconsin is completely different than other states in that we do do a public input process to ask hunters to tell us what the seasons are. Other states, 
they just set the seasons just because they, you know, all right, this is what we're going to do. You know, two guys in an office setting the season. Whereas we have this culture in Wisconsin of asking the public to give us feedback on what the seasons will be. And it's tough when we're talking 65,000 waterfowl hunters in the state of Wisconsin, trying to find a 60 day time slot is, uh, is nearly an impossible task. And that's, you know, it's what we hear each year is, oh, well, we should be hunting earlier or we should be pushing that season later and trying to manage a season framework because right now we're fortunate. Waterfowl numbers have been great over the last 15 or 20 years. So most of our seasons and our hunting regulations are not really based on biological concerns because duck numbers are doing good. We have a pretty good idea that we're not directly influencing those numbers based on the harvest that's happening here in the state of Wisconsin. So we can set seasons based on feedback from hunters. But the important thing to know is just because you provided feedback and input and you didn't get what you wanted this time doesn't mean we're not listening. You know, that that you might be the minority of, of what people are thinking. And so that's that's a big one is making sure that you reach out and whether it's you or your friends or everybody that you hunt with or people that you talk to, you know, at a restaurant or at a tavern saying, hey, this is what we want the season to be. Make sure you reach out because if you don't provide that input, then I have no idea what those seasons are going to be. I think it's important that folks know that we have multiple stakeholder groups in the state that play a very active role in the you know, construction and maintenance per se of the rules and regulation process. And it's not just, you know, the standard general public, it's not just the WDNR, it's not the US Fish and Wildlife Service. It's being able to communicate and advocate through a pipeline of organizations such as the Wildlife Federation, the Wisconsin Waterfowl Association, Green Bay Duck Hunters, Cross County Conservation Alliance, and numerous other the Conservation Congress. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, again, what Mark just laid out is there's tens of thousands of people represented right there that have a uh, coordinated effort that know that this is how things have to be done. So again, whether you're part of those organizations and you reach out and say, hey, I want my voice to be part of the larger voice, or you directly reach out to us, that's that's ways that we can set those those regulations and hunting seasons. And not just hunting seasons, again, we whether we're talking we need to create a new waterfowl refuge, or we need to update you know a boat dock or we need to do those things again we we have staff across the state but right now there's more work than our staff can possibly get to so if you see something don't hesitate to reach out give us a call let us know so then we can put this as a priority for for the department to work on or that we can partner with you know wisconsin wildlife federation the waterfowl association where we have an adopt a wildlife area program or things along those lines that you could directly help and making sure that you're benefiting the, the areas that you want. You know, just the, the Wildlife Federation in Wisconsin has, well, since 1949, has played a major role in targeted and non-targeted species, you know, environmental issues, you know, all hunting, fishing, and trapping from big game to small game. Um, and there's numerous other organizations, but, you know, with the 20 committees on the Federation that we have, you know, the general public has the great sounding board to send an email, you know, to make a phone call to voice their opinion. Right. And it's a direct feedback to Taylor and, or other, you know, branches or groups inside the department or agency staff that they have, you know, great feedback from the general public to help create. Yeah, I mean, directly, we we're talking with all those stakeholders. The Wildlife Federation was a major partner in the recently approved uh, Wisconsin Waterfowl Management Plan. So this is a, a document that uh, we put together that's going to guide the next 10 years of waterfowl management in the state. So for those that are watching, I've, you know, given some teasers on some of the other topics that we'll be covering, but things like updating our open water hunting reg regulations, like are there ways that we can either add other lakes or make those regulations simpler? We're going to be working together directly with our stakeholder groups and Mark um, on a committee that we can try to figure that stuff out. Or can we add some fall surveys? Like like other states, you know, Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, they fly multiple surveys throughout the fall to tell hunters have birds move through, or where they at, what's the number. So again, it can give an update. Wisconsin really doesn't do that. We fly on the Mississippi River and we fly Green Bay, but the whole whole actual part of the state we have 
you know, not a great grasp on when those birds are coming through. And I think that that'll be a, a huge uh, way for us to continue to provide information to the public, not the hunting as well as the birding communities that, you know, this is when, if you want to go out and you want to see all the pintails, well, plan to be on the Mississippi River, you know, the first three or four weeks of October or things along those lines. So again, our plan is to to try to advance those things, just like what we're doing here today. As part of the waterfowl management plan is providing a new way to communicate the work that our stakeholder groups and the DNR are doing, whether it's, you know, me on all of these different committees and going, you know, across the country to represent Wisconsin, or it's our field staff, our wildlife technicians that are out there, you know, updating a dike or we're putting brand new moist soil management out there and so you as hunters and the public know that the resources that are being expended towards managing the species is properly being managed so um, other things in the management plan we're talking about research so again we actually just sat down at the dnr and we're working with ben sedger um, uh, dr ben sedger at uw stevens point to identify some new research here in the state of wisconsin whether that's looking at how we're spending your duck dollars and assessing are we putting good habitat out there or are we just putting habitat out there and what, what's the difference between that uh, right now we're in a huge mallard telemetry study project that like i said is a, a future entire podcast in itself of where are urban birds going compared to rural birds going um are the birds that we're capturing actually birds from wisconsin or where exactly are were they raised and hatched and then we're pulling genetics in terms of looking to see if are these wild north american birds or is there stock that's coming from europe because out on the atlantic coast a lot of people are a lot of private organizations are putting out uh pen reared mallards that have European stock and we're trying to see is there a difference in survival between those pen reared birds and how they interact with wild North American birds and so a huge study out of uh, uh, Michigan so hopefully that we can have uh, Ben Lukanen be part of the podcast and come and give us an update on all of that. I think we're going to be able to provide some great information to the public. I think a lot of it is going to answer some questions that we thought we had answers for that realistically we weren't even on the right page, right? I right. think, you know, ask Indiana where their mallards are coming from. And they're probably now going to start to give you some different answers on, on where those mallards are coming from. Right. Yeah. And, and again, I don't want to, you know, I want to recognize that we're also going to be talking about things like turkey hunting, you know, that, you know, we... Again, 30, 40 years ago, there weren't hardly any turkeys in the state of Wisconsin. And now we're sitting here with, you know, putting out 100, over 100,000 tags each spring um, that people can get. We have different regions and different seasons. And again, how our population is now compared to say what it was 10 years ago. Because 10 years ago, we saw the peak in turkey numbers and now we're seeing something basically stabilized at a lower level and what does that actually mean is it you know is turkey numbers going down or is it you know a reflection of okay they've just stabilized at where they're at and how much better wisconsin is right now compared to states down south like missouri or alabama or mississippi that have seen a crisis in their turkey numbers and again wisconsin's been holding pretty steady so yeah we'll touch base on those types of topics on you know the pheasant stocking program how we strat you know strategize about where those birds are going and then where that money's being spent to you know increase grassland habitat for not just pheasants but as well as you know other grassland nesting species and anything and everything that we can talk about yeah i just saw a turkey cross the street on 43rd and capitol yeah <laughs> obviously he took the train to the right the stop right? no if, if i had a nickel for every time i heard turkey and wawatos in the same sentence over the last year and a half uh, i would be a rich man so they're downtown they're you know jumping up on people's vehicles because they see their self in the reflection or else you know they're battering on people's windows or chasing mailmen and chasing people out of grocery stores so you know it's it's not just a, a, a rural thing anymore they're absolutely everywhere right right and i, I think this is going to you know again it's going to be a great opportunity to provide information and data that folks don't realize you know how how good wisconsin has it right now in regards to the natural resources uh, you know shout out to Amy Shipley yep. who uh, is now our head research scientist for waterfowl in the state so you know hopefully we'll have Amy on here in the, in the near future and uh, 
how important waterfowl science and research is to not just our hunting season, but to the overall, you know, scope of migratory birds and how they can affect a piece of property per se. Right. Or, yeah. you know, how they affect the other inhabitants of a piece of property. Yeah, I mean, when you look at Wisconsin, the resources we have, we got over 5 million acres of wetlands. We got 15,000 lakes. You're bordered by two Great Lakes, the Mississippi River, uh, Horicon, Marsh, Cat. I mean, we have a plethora of opportunity as well as habitat, and we sit at the, you know, at the northern end of the flyway. So for us to make sure that we're doing positive management and positive research, directly influences anything and everything that's going to be migrating south and people that are going to see throughout the rest of the flyway. So I, I, we used to you know, be this premier state for waterfowl research and we're slowly working our way back towards that after having a couple of decades of you know, things being a little bit slower in terms of, of research. But now we have some awesome people on board and we're actually getting a ton of work done. So. And a couple of years ago, we started this great event, the Waterfall Expo or Wisconsin Hunter Expo up in Oshkosh. And I think that is going to be another great opportunity for outreach and information for the Wisconsin Waterfall Hunter, as well as folks who enjoy the outdoor community here in the state, um, from shooting to decoy carving, duck calling, goose calling, uh, cooking demonstrations and then presentations on like the stuff that we're talking about the science whether we're saying this is a fish and wildlife service property or usgs or this is a university study or this is something from the dnr we're going to be having talks on all of those um, and then again vendors like this is a time for any waterfowler uh, to come out and be part of a community that really looks forward to this. Like I said, we have, you know, tens of thousands of waterfowl hunters across the state, and this is an opportunity to get out prior to the hunting season. And, you know, oh, do I, oh, I'm gonna need to look at this. Or there's dogs walking around. You can get ideas from dog trainers on how to, you know, fine tune those things to make sure that your dog's ready for the hunting season. Or there's a piece of equipment that you just had to have a, a layout boat that you're like, ah, oh, that's going to make sure that this is going to make my hunting season as good as it could possibly be. And so, yeah, it's a, a single day event that, you know, we're only in its third year coming up here and we, we have seen significant growth, really popular in terms of uh, the amount of people that are coming out and enjoying it. Where's Watson? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I should. He'd probably be whining or barking. No, I recently, he's about four months old, a black lab. So as, if I didn't have enough work going on, I had to add a dog into it yeah, and doing well, my own training. Gonna, so I'm probably going to see Watson in one of the podcasts. Right. Right. But some of the other things that, you know, the expo will do is it's going to put money back to the resources of the state in a couple different ways. Uh, one of the ways is we are going to give multiple scholarships in conjunction with the Expo and Wildlife Federation um, back into waterfall resources, law enforcement, education, um, as well as science, right? So I think, you know, come visit the Expo, give us your ideas, your thoughts on what you want to see at the Expo, uh, give us your thoughts on what you want to talk about on the podcast and what you want to see in Wisconsin. Yeah, it's it's truly a, a relatively cheap event to come to and you know that the money is directly going back into the resource here in the state of Wisconsin. Not just the scholarship, not just the re, uh, research, but also money from the expo is going to directly fund a position that's going to be doing habitat management with the DNR and Wisconsin Waterfowl Association to manage property, state property, so that hunters can directly, hunter and non-hunters alike, can directly benefit from it. So yeah, all in all, it's like I said, it's it's a really, it's a nice day in the summer to come out. There's outside events, there's shooting events, there's things inside that you can be doing. It, shot. Yep. And it's a, it is a full day. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing is we're always looking for volunteers, right? So um, we will provide information uh, for you guys to, and, and women out there to get a hold of Todd Schaller and some of the other folks with the Expo Steering Committee to, to volunteer. Uh, there's, there's endless opportunities with different tasks and projects to volunteer your time from four hours to the whole day. Yep. And we want to make sure everybody has ample time to walk through the event and, and take it all in as well.
Perfect. Yeah. So no. Um, and, and like you said, there you can reach out. We'll we'll provide links to the Waterfall Expo's web page if you wanted to buy advance tickets, or there's there's uh, social media platforms that they have. So uh, feel free to take a look. And uh, if there's anything that you have any questions on, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Let us know. Let us know. You know, some of the other things we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about bluebills. We're going to talk about canvas backs. We're going to talk about pintails because Lord knows we're right on the edge. You know, are we going to shoot? one or two canvas backs are we going to be able to shoot a pintail right you know how are the bluebills doing are we going to have, continue to have to have this crazy bluebill season right um yeah it's it's and, and for folks the reason why we're going to have to be talking about that is you know the prairies have seen probably two or three of the dry, driest years we've had in the last 25 years over the last five years so you know things habitat that was marginal but was ended up being good because it's been super wet when you have dry years all of a sudden that marginal habitat's bad habitat and so fortunately this last year we had pretty good wet conditions so we should expect a, a decent flight for this uh for when we do our spring breeding survey this year you know get an idea of how things shook out but you know those couple of dry years directly influenced duck numbers whether we're talking mallards which went down or teal which went down or pintail which has been going down for 40 or 50 years now um canvasback's been holding pretty steady but then like you said with scop you know the the goofy two scop for 45 days and one scop for 15 it makes it a nightmare for those guys that are hunting green bay or lake michigan and you're gonna spend all the time to take your layout boat out there and string out 100 decoys to shoot one scop sure doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense when you can see tens of thousands flying out about a mile away from you or they're all piling into your decoys and you're thinking what we can only shoot one of these well i know there's going to be a lot more people on lake michigan trying to shoot a mandarin duck right? oh my so. gosh yeah make sure that you're being safe i heard somebody tried to get mugged uh while trying to take a picture of that mandarin duck yeah. on yeah so yeah, black belly whistling ducks right in horror con um being harvested on the Mississippi River, Wisconsin River. A couple of harlequins were shot this year that I heard from. Just, Michigan. Yeah, definitely. Again, the resources that we have out here are absolutely awesome. So, and, and just, you have a chance to see something weird. Uh, a couple of springs ago, we had a brant goose that came through the state of Wisconsin. We are a thousand plus miles away from anywhere a brant goose should possibly be. And so the fact that we had a ton of birders, life listers, people that were going out there to try to get a picture of it. It's like people enjoy this as a resource, not just to go after it or go, you know, hunt it. it this is something that's awesome that people, thousands of people across the state would never maybe have the opportunity to go out and see it. So yeah. Well, somebody texted me a picture during hunting season this year and said, I never saw a duck like this, or is this a goose? And here it was a muscovy. Yeah. <laughs> said, well, We're going to do some education, too, as part of this podcast that, you know, that, that farm duck muscovy is, you, you can see it, in, you know. We call that a good eater. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah there's not, not, not so much flying in that one. Right, so on our, on our next podcast, we'll probably dive into 2023 and a little bit more of the rule and regulation process and because we're coming in to that right, right. coming into rule and regulation seasons and, and get a hold of your stakeholder groups and you know potential changes for 2023 uh, we'll say that yeah we'll talk about the hunting the turkey hunting season that'll be coming up I, I believe most of you probably already just received your card in the mail make sure that you got the the right season that you wanted and we'll address some of the questions that come up of how come you know my friend he's never applied or never applied before but he got his first time this one and i can't get my first application you know for the last three or four years we'll talk about how that process works out and we'll talk about how the tag numbers get set and you know some of the new research that's going into looking at turkey numbers and how we can start estimating populations and as you said for the waterfowl season aren't doing let's talk about the teal season let's talk about you know canada goose bag limits and things along those lines so yeah absolutely so again thanks everyone i appreciate you tuning in and uh, like you said this is the hide podcast brought to you by milford hills uh, again a pre the premier shooting facility here in the state of wisconsin and again thanks to uh grit production for putting this together so i'll tell you this that without chase and grit the waterfall expo uh, would not be at the level that is at, um, that it's at right now, yeah. and I think we would not be sitting here 
without uh, Chase and Grid right now, without Grid Productions. And I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows that, you know, it's, it's hard to find people with a niche, right? But it, you find certain people with a niche that have the ability to branch off and create diversity. So whether you are, you know, a multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar, or maybe just a couple thousand dollar uh, business, you're looking for people like Chase who can adapt to pretty much any opportunity to provide a quality piece um, and, and help your business or your endeavors grow. And uh, I think if anybody's looking for that, I think they should look Chase up. And if those of you who know me, I'm not gonna tell you, I'm not gonna give you a bad, bad piece of information or it might come back to me. So thank you so much, Chase, for everything that you do for all of us. And now I can say thank you so much for everything that you do for the resource, for everything you do for the R3 program, you know, that Horicon Learn Now program, the Professional Learn Now program, which we'll definitely be talking about on the podcast as well. So, you know, thanks again, Milford Hills, uh, Lloyd Marks. Thanks again, Chase and, and Grit Productions for everything that you do for conservation. Thank you so much.